Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. So with all of this web components and so on in place, right, it finally leads us to the topic of frameworks, right, front-end frameworks as they are called. So the first thing that we would ask is, you know, what is the purpose of a framework, right? We are looking at some kind of a context where some kind of basic functionality is already available, right? So the Python programming language can already, you know, it has as part of its standard library, it has like network interfaces. It can create, a, you know, a function that will listen on a port, okay? It can manipulate strings. So it can append strings together, it can create new strings, it can even do some kind of basic templating and, you know, filling in text and so on, okay? Similarly, JavaScript has the functionality for extending elements. So custom element is already defined, right? And it has the DOM manipulation APIs. So that sounds great. It means that in principle, I can, you know, already create any kind of web-based application using Python, or I can create any kind of web component using JavaScript, right? The problem is there will be a lot of code repetition. And this word boilerplate is something that you would have probably come across in multiple places. Boilerplate basically means it's a standard repeating thing, right? It's the same thing that you're going to do multiple places. Right. So, for example, you might find that, you know, anytime you are writing a new Python program, the first thing you need to do is import a bunch of things. Right. And to some extent, you might find that it's so repetitive that, you know, look, why don't I just have a sort of boilerplate starter code, right, which allows me to get started without having to type in all those imports one by one. I know that I'm always going to be importing the same things. Okay. So that's boilerplate code repetition. We would like to avoid it if possible. It also means that there will be a lot of reinventing of the wheel, right? Because people have different coding styles, they have different coding techniques, and ultimately that results in many different ways of creating components, using components, mixing them together, and so on. So the solution that it's not unique to JavaScript or Python or anything else of that sort, it's a standard technique for, you know, you try and identify standard techniques for solving common problems, right? And this ultimately is related to the concept of design patterns that I have been talking about repeatedly through the course, right? Model view controller was in some sense a form of design pattern, right? Ultimately, all that it comes about is, you know, there is experience that people have come up, come up with over years of trying to do things in a certain way. They try and distill that and, you know, take out the essence of it and put it in a form that can then be reused by others. And when that is done nicely, it is really powerful and you know, a lot of people tend to use such things. That is what a framework is, right? And Flask, for example, is a framework for creating Python web applications. React is one of the frameworks that's available for creating JavaScript components. Not exactly JavaScript web components, right? There is a difference between React components and JavaScript web components. You know, once again, it's partly, you know, different styles of doing things, right? But they are all trying to solve similar problems. React focuses only on the user interface, whereas Web Components does a bit more slightly, you know, including the state of the system and so on. There are some differences. There are some similarities as well. Once again, you can see that, you know, it ultimately comes down to, okay, is it popular? Is it easy to use? Yeah, people will use it. Now, in the context of JavaScript, a lot of the frameworks that have come up are built around this concept of single page applications, right? And many JavaScript front end frameworks are focused on enabling this in different ways. Part of the reason for the popularity of single page applications is because a single page application effectively becomes an app by itself, right? Which does not need like multiple different web pages that you need to navigate through. All the sort of communication happens in the back with JavaScript. A lot of the computation may also happen with JavaScript, which means that the user experience becomes a lot more smooth than if you need to keep on clicking on pages and waiting for a web page to load. Okay. And that was the focus of many of the JavaScript front ends, at least, at least to start with. Okay. So one example that I'm just going to use in order to demonstrate a little bit about how you might use a framework is React. It is one of the most popular ones that are available today. But like I said, you know, this is 
I'm sure there would be like very strong opinions in other directions saying that look not react you should use angular or you should use view or you should use something else or you know all of these are a bad idea right so I don't want to get into the whether it's a good idea or a bad idea I'm just saying this is one possibility it's a library which has its primary purpose as building user interfaces okay it's declarative right remember HTML and declarative syntax once again you try and specify what you want rather than how to draw it on the screen okay the how to draw also has to be specified but the react once you have defined a bunch of react components it allows you to basically say what you want to create with them okay and the components themselves contain internal details of how to go about getting that result right they are different from web components but somewhat similar ideas different techniques for achieving sort of similar results okay web components tend to be more imperative they actually attach the functionality that needs to be done directly as functions inside the component whereas react is more declarative it focuses on composing a user interface by putting different components together okay not a trivial thing to understand but you know fairly okay uh, straightforward when you get into uh, i mean there are differences and both can be handled in different ways well, let's take a couple of examples of react which is directly available from their main web page itself okay so this is the main react web page right and you can see that it contains all the information about it it also has a very nice demonstration of how react works right and in fact all of these are basically some kind of react components that are being used in order to display all of uh, these demo demo applications right and you can actually go in here and you know make changes directly in the code right and you can literally see that as you type instantaneously it is updating on the side Right? it's not even like the code pen examples where the html css javascript and then it would go and update the react components are pretty much instantaneous you type and the reaction is immediate that's because of you know the fact that they are using react on both sides whereas the code pen page was a more generic sort of solution it allows you to type in certain things and then update later right so what we have over here is that you know you have a component you modify it and it immediately goes and changes something out here right and what has happened is basically by creating this class hello message which extends react.component it has told you what needs to be displayed that it should be a div like this okay and within that div i could go and add more information right i could just go in there and type some more text and I could you know for example say put a line break right and all of that immediately gets rendered on the other side because it's all being done in JavaScript on your browser there's no going back to the server out here okay now we also have something which is a stateful component right so for example this timer out here right it started out by initializing the value of seconds to zero ever since then every second this number is ticking away okay and all that this component does is it just basically displays the state dot seconds okay and of course like before i can you know add more uh, text over here and it would update the screen right and you can see that you know all but the interesting thing is as soon as i made a change over here effectively the component was reinitialized which is why the seconds went back to zero and started counting again from there so that's one thing to keep in mind right? i mean this is not normally the way that you are expected to use it you don't change the component and expect it to update right whenever you make a change in the component yes it has to reevaluate from scratch it's even more powerful right i mean i can actually create something like a to do list right here i can just basically say item 1 item 2 something else and so on and it's just basically adding all of that out here now is it actually creating a to-do list no it's not saving it to a database it's not connecting somewhere else it's not sort of you know allowing you to delete or update or anything else with the to-do list but you can see that as far as the user interface is concerned it's very clean it's very fast and it has a nice way of basically just encapsulating the functionality that you need okay 
and you know there are others so for example you could even directly have markdown right as one of the components over here you could have this text and you know as you can see it renders the output by actually calling a markdown processor out here so what's the bottom line i mean why was all this useful because ultimately what react is allowing you to do is to create these kind of components right i have a to do app which extends react component it has certain properties it has state and so on right all of which are coded properly into the javascript out here but once you have that it just is able to create this entire list and allow you to use that for the user interface it doesn't tell you anything about the back end right it can be combined with other kinds of backends in fact you could potentially even combine a react front end possibly with a php backend if necessary right although there are also ways of doing it such that even the backend is handled by other things which are similar in javascript itself okay so all of that are different I mean, um, that all of those things are different ways of handling the separation between the front end and back end react as per their definition at least they try and stick as much as possible just to the front end okay so so react is one of the more popular front end frameworks that's available today is it the only one by no means there are plenty right numerically it's probably the most popular at present angular with its origins from google is also very well supported right it has a lot of capabilities similar right in terms of creating reusable components ember js is something which both provides components as well as a service framework so it also allows you to define services and routes and so on view is another one. so ember js is probably a bit more than just a front end framework it also does a little bit of the you know some of the back end part view for example is something similar to react it's very often it comes up as an alternative to react which is supposed to be simpler in some ways and so on right it also has sort of a lot of commonalities with angular many of these things what you will find is that you know the initial versions have certain functionality they tend to get more and more complicated and then there is a sort of simplification that happens and people come up with new designs that are simplified or faster versions of what was there before right and that's part of the natural learning process if you think about it once again the mozilla developer network does have a lot of information about these things including tutorials on how to build certain kinds of apps using these using you know several different frameworks right so you can even compare the different frameworks by trying all of them out so to summarize everything that we have so far html5 ultimately has sort of settled as a kind of living standard right there will be no major changes in the standard but is going to be continuously adapted as time goes on right so minor changes in the document that maintains the living standard are always going to be there now the adaptation layer that allows you to sort of you know put in new functionality or extend the functionality of html5 comes from javascript and javascript basically means that you know html plus css for styling plus javascript yeah you can pretty much create any kind of app that you want okay basic raw html plus css plus javascript can be difficult to code in by itself which is where frameworks come in to fill in the gaps right they provide ways of taking out a lot of the boilerplate making certain things easier while at the same time providing their own opinions on how certain things should be done right now ultimately what this means is that this is probably the way to go in terms of the front end development if you want dynamic applications things that are you know highly responsive to users and because a lot of the work is done by javascript at the users end itself before even requiring a network communication the network very often ends up being the slowest part of the entire chain which means that if you can do a lot of work using javascript at the users end then it simplifies it now this does not mean that you should try and overuse javascript and you know make it very fancy web pages with a lot of animations as far as that is concerned you still need to go back to the basics of ui design and aesthetics and all of those principles that we have already discussed multiple times in the past okay so html plus css plus javascript is probably the basis of front end design it is the basis of front end design today and very likely to remain so for quite a while in the future